Hey guys, Mike here from Lunch Money Comics. I have a pretty cool video for you today because I want to share with you a comic book collection I recently acquired. It's only 130 books, but there's a lot of good ones in there, and perhaps just as fun as the comic books is the story of how I got these comic books, where they came from, and how they ended up in my basement from across the continent. I will tell you that story and show you the books after the coins drop. Like most comic book collectors I know, I get my comic books from lots of different sources. Obviously my favorite is, you know, flea markets, yard sales, and antique shops, but of course I also get them at comic book shops, comic shows, and online. Usually I go on eBay, but I also check the social media sites, and one of my absolute favorite places to hunt for comic books is actually on Facebook. So for those of you who don't know, Facebook has a feature called Marketplace that lets people basically put stuff up for sale, someone can contact them, and they work out how to pay for it and you know how to ship that item. But the best part of it is that you can also search locally. You can put in your zip code or you know uh, your town or city that you live in in a radius and it will give you your results. So I'll go in and say, hey, I live here. Show me comic books in the area and it will give me a pretty good uh, sampling of New England people selling comic books. Um, and I think the best part about this is that you know you can see the things first. You can go somewhere and actually look at them and then pay cash. You don't have to worry about shipping. You don't have to worry about insurance. You don't have to worry about like PayPal fees, things like that. It's relatively safe. You won't get scammed. Although obviously you want to meet in a public place if you're ever meeting someone online. So using Facebook Marketplace Local has been one of my favorite ways to hunt for comic books. There's just a couple of problems. One, most of the comic books I find locally are either junk or they're overpriced or they're both. And whenever I do very rarely find a really good comic book collection pop up, um, at a great value with great books in it, it's always scoffed up like this. New England is very competitive, not just for comic books, but for all collectibles, antiques, things like that. Whenever someone puts up something that's a little too good to be true, someone will scoff it up within like an hour of the posting. But the comic book collection I'm going to show you today was acquired on Facebook Marketplace. It's a pretty good size, some pretty great books, and it was a fantastic price for what it is. How then did I get it? Well, I didn't. See, I, not only did I not get it in New England, I didn't get it myself at all. I have to thank my little sister who lives in Portland, Oregon. So uh, I have two sisters. One of them is my Irish twin because we're so similar in age. We grew up liking the same stuff. We both love the X-Men animated series. Uh, she loves Jean Grey. So she knows a lot about comic books and comic book characters, even though she doesn't collect them. But especially since the start of my channel, she's been really looking at a lot of these you know, social media sites, trying to find some good comic book deals. So every once in a while, she'll send me a picture or two saying, hey, someone's offering this out here. Are you interested? Same thing like you know, New England, they're either junk or they're overpriced. But in this particular case, she started sending me pictures and I started going through them I'm like, oh, those are pretty good. Wow, those are really good. And I said, well, you know, how much are they asking? She said, $80 for 130 books. And I said, that's a fantastic deal. I mean, there were a couple of books, guys, you'll see that are close to 80 bucks by themselves. I said, get it, absolutely get it. And she said, I'm happy to hear you say that because I already bought it. See, what had happened was out there because it's not so competitive, this listing just kind of stayed there. Like no one scoffed it up, which gave her time to do some research on her own and come up with kind of a fair market value price. And her intent was to surprise me for my birthday by buying it. She just kind of wanted to double check that after she bought it, she didn't make a mistake. But honestly, guys, you'll see she did fabulously. This is a great collection. So we talked on the phone. We talked about, you know, uh, what was in there, about the research that she did. It was a great conversation. But eventually we came to the topic of, great, how are you going to get them to me? Because 130 comic books, guys, are kind of heavy and would have ended up costing her a lot of money to ship these. Well, we came up with a solution. So this was a few months ago that this, she actually bought these. But this spring, she was coming to visit me here in New England. And we make a big deal about it. You know, the whole family comes to see her because we don't see her very often. Happened to be my daughter's birthday as well. So we had this big plan that we'd have a party. Could she travel across the country with these comic books? And we came to the solution that, yeah, that was actually the most cost effective way. So what she did was she got a carry on suitcase and she very carefully packaged all the comic books and, you know, put it in the overhead compartment and flew across the country. And it ended up being much cheaper than shipping it. So I'm going to show you some footage right now of her arriving at my house and me opening up the suitcase and seeing these comic books for the very first time. <laughs> wow. Wow, cool. And, then, and the ones that are in the nice boards are in the middle. Do you want me to show like some I mean, I'm of gonna, them? I'm gonna go through them all by one by one. Okay. These ones, you can tell the ones that are boarded. 
Right. And then the cheap ones are I just like throw on top to like protect them. The yep. nice ones. Oh, that's smart. Well, the ones I thought were nice. Did you bore all these? Most of them. Some, yeah. most of them. About half of them I did. All right, I'll have to go through and check them out. This one still cracks me up. Oh, yeah. Cool. Oh, that's a good one. And then I did all the Sergeant Furies. Nice, actually. This one goes uh, good next to the other one. So as you can see, she did a pretty good job of packaging up all these comic books as safe as possible in a suitcase to survive the flight across the country. And as I was looking at these comic books for the first time, I was getting excited, guys. I found a couple of good ones. I really wanted to dig into these and see what was actually in there. But of course, I couldn't because we were having a party going on upstairs. My entire extended family was here. I wanted to hang out with him, of course, you know, and the last thing the host of the party could do was disappear into his basement for two hours to look at comic books. So what we decided to do was, Let's just sort them right now as we take them out of the suitcase and I will talk about them later. So we sorted them into four general piles. The first one is cartoons, TV, and movie themed comic books. Also some miscellaneous ones were in there. And as you're gonna see in this collection, there were a lot of like 80s cartoon themed comic books and 80s movies uh, that were collected. The second pile is Western and war themed comic books, mostly war comic books. There were a ton of them. And then the last two piles were DC and Marvel. Most of those, of course, are superhero comic books, but not necessarily. There's also a bonus fifth pile, which is some of the comic books that I thought were the best of the best or the ones that I find the most interesting and wanted to talk about on my channel. Now, one other observation I made as we were taking these out was it was a very odd collection in that it wasn't completely random. It seemed like whoever collected these was actually trying to like curate a real collection. There are a disproportionately high number of first issues in this collection but the titles they collected are odd. So I can't say much more about that until I show you the books, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. But other than that time when we took those comic books out, I have not looked at these comic books at all. They're still in the four piles that we made on the day my sister was here, have not looked at them since. They've been taking up place on my table. So rather than go through them beforehand and talk about them after I've researched it, I decided it would be more fun for me to talk about them and look at them really for the first time with every single one of you. So that's what we're going to do. So before we go through these comic books and find out exactly what was in there, just a quick reminder, if you like this sort of stuff and you wanna support the channel, go down, hit that like button, leave me a comment, feel free to subscribe if you haven't already. You can also follow me on Instagram under Lunch Money Comics IG. All right, let's find out what my sister got me. So there are 130 comic books here. I gotta go through them kind of quickly. So let's start with the cartoon, TV, and movie pile. There's a lot of stuff here from the 80s, so if you're a fan of 80s nostalgia, you're going to like the stack. I mentioned there were lots of first issues, but I forgot to mention there were also lots of duplicates. It's as if whoever collected these was hoping some of these would be worth money someday, and you'll see what I mean right off the bat. Here we have Strawberry Shortcake number one. I believe it's from 1985. Uh, this is a cartoon that my sisters used to watch. Okay, I might have watched it too. Um, I don't know if it's particularly worth that much money, but I have two of them. Uh, I'm sure there's a collector out there who appreciates these. But while these might not be worth that much money, I'm pretty sure the next one is. This is another 80s cartoon. This is Care Bears number one. Um, again, this is a show I used to watch as a kid. And I know these Care Bear books can be worth a little bit of money because I've found them in the wild before and was able to sell them. People like these books. So this is the first issue, it's in really good shape and I think it's worth a little bit of money. Let me know down in the comments guys on any of these books um, if you know more about them than I do. Here's another 80s cartoon this, which is familiar to a lot of people in my generation. This is Smurfs number one. I used to watch these little blue guys when I was a kid. We have a uh, Gargamel right here and his cat Azrael. I actually had a stuffed animal of Azrael. Uh, again, first issue, but I don't just have one. No, I have two, three, four, Five. I have five copies of Smurfs number one. Again, I don't know what the intent of the person uh, collecting these was, but uh, now I got them. I also have uh, Smurfs number two. Uh, we got some awesome 80s movies here. We have Blade Runner number one. This is the comic adaptation of the 1982 movie. Uh, it's a Ridley Scott movie uh, starring Harrison Ford, of course. In my not so humble opinion, I think it's one of the greatest sci-fi movies ever made. And I don't just have one. I got two. Very cool right there. Uh, oh, speaking of Harrison Ford, we did a good job stacking these comic books, evidently. We have Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom number one, number one in a three-issue limited series. And we also have The Further Adventures of Indiana Jones number two. Uh, pretty cool. 
Uh, this book's great. This is a show I watched all the time when I was a kid. The A-Team. We got Mr. T right there. This is A-Team number one. And I also have A-Team number two. Um, hey, I just said uh, that Blade Runner was the best sci-fi movie of all time, or one of them. Uh, here's another contender, 2001 Space Odyssey number one. Um, of course, this is the adaptation of the Stanley Kubrick film. Ooh, that's a tough call. Let me know down in the comments, guys, which movie you like better, 2001 Space Odyssey or Blade Runner. Two completely different movies, I might add. Oh, man, this next book is fantastic. Might be my favorite of the lot. This is The Dark Crystal number one. Both me and my sister loved this movie when we were kids. Of course, it's a movie by Jim Henson and uh, Frank Oz. Um, also, a lot of the puppets were based off of uh, art by Brian Froud, who's an artist who did lots of like whimsical type things. Fantastic movie. One of my favorite movies of all time. Still is to this day. Absolutely love it. Uh, this is in a really high grade condition. Uh, I'm definitely going to hold on to this one for a long time. I actually offered it to my sister as sort of a thank you, uh, but she said no, I could keep it. So Dark Crystal number one. Very excited uh, to find this one and happy to geek out a little bit with my sister when we pulled it out. Uh, here's a random Star Trek one. This is Star Trek number two. Don't know of any significance there. This is Sledgehammer number one. This is based on the television show in the 80s. I never watched it. I was too young for that. But uh, let me know down in the comments if you know anything about Sledgehammer. We have two copies of Conan the Barbarian movie special. I'm guessing these are the Arnold Schwarzenegger movie they're based on. Not so sure, but pretty cool. Now we got some weird stuff, guys. I have no idea what these are. So this is Defenders of the Earth number one. Um, this is, you know, a Marvel comic, but it's their Star Comics imprint that they did lots of, like, cartoons and adaptations of cartoons on. So I don't know if Defenders of the Earth was a cartoon or not. Again, let me know down in the comments if you ever watched it. And we get some more. We have Planet Terry number one. We have Wally the Wizard number one. I have heard of this one. This is Top Dog number one. Everyone's heard of this one. This is a Flintstone comic book. Um, this one, in fact, is uh, Barney and Betty Rubble number 18, I guess. Oh. Uh, next, we have the only Archie book that was in the collection. Uh, laugh. This one's really cool. So this one here is Gladstone Comics, the original Dick Tracy. Obviously, it's not the original Dick Tracy. It's not old, uh, but the art in it looks old. Um, I don't know if this is based on the movie either. It says 1990 on it. There you go. Now we have some old 10 cent Dells. We have Tom and Jerry. We have some uh, Looney Tunes. So we have Bugs Bunny and Elmer Fudd there. We have another uh, Bugs Bunny and Elmer Fudd. We have a couple of Sad Sack and the Sarge comic books. See these every once in a while. This is, <laughs> no idea. Red Circle Comics, The Mighty Crusaders, number one. Never heard of them, uh, but it's pretty cool. We have some uh, cool art on the back as well. Neat, kind of almost like a wraparound cover. I see these all the time. This is a Charlton Comics Ghostly Tales, like these old horror books. Very cool. This is Whitman Comics uh, Flash Gordon. Uh, I'm not sure on the number of it, but it's Flash Gordon, always cool. We have another Whitman Comics Shadow Play Tales of the Supernatural. Another Whitman, here we go. We have Boris Karloff Tales of Mystery. Uh, this has a special place in my heart because the first comic books I ever got, uh, someone gifted me a box when I was like eight years old and there was a whole bunch of Boris Karloff. And the stories in here were way too mature and scary for an eight-year-old, but um, I still read them and they have a special place in my heart when I see these uh, Boris Karloff books here. Then we have Eagle Comics Presents Robo Hunter number one. No idea. Then we have two comic books that are courtesy of Radio Shack. So here we have one uh, based on 80s computer whiz kids and one on electronics. Then we have the true story of Smokey the Bear. And then the last one is The Cross in the Switchblade. So this is based off of a novel and a later movie um, about a real life like pastor who goes to like an inner city uh, gang area and tries converting some of the gang members. Uh, again, based on a true story. Um, and this is the comic adaptation. I don't have much more to say about that because I never read the book or saw the movie. So that was all of the cartoon, TV, and movie themed comic books. Let's move on now to the Western and War comics. As I'm looking right now, I realize there are only four Western comics, so let's go through them quickly. We have the Rawhide Kid 104 and 114. These appear to be from the early 70s. The Rawhide Kid obviously is a cowboy Western-themed superhero, and I believe, I believe he was created by Stan Lee in like the late uh, early 
60s, late 50s, somewhere around there. Um, either way, he's been around for a long time, uh, as evidenced by this next comic book. Uh, this is the Rawhide Kid number one of a four-part limited series. I'm not sure when this is from. Uh, the price kind of indicates that it was from the 80s, but um, clearly he's a character that's persisted. I don't know anything about the Rawhide Kid other than the Stan Lee connection. Let me know down in the comments uh, if you know any more about him. And then next up, we have a Tencent Dell. This is cool. This is Roy Rogers Comics. Um, what year is this from? 1953. So that Roy Rogers was the king of the cowboys. He was in, I think, hundreds of cowboy movies back in the day. And I really like these sort of like 1950s golden age books where they just put like a literal picture of the actor on the cover. You saw it with Westerns. You saw it with Tarzan books. Um, I just love these. You know, they're a snapshot in time, especially with all of the ads. So uh, very cool. I'm not really into Western comic books, but uh, this is a pretty cool one from the 50s. All right, let's go through the war ones. There are a lot of them here. I'll go through them quick and show you the cooler covers. Uh, this is War is Hell number three. We have a whole bunch of issues of this DC um, fighting forces featuring the losers. Um, I don't know anything about this series. We also have some fighting army books. Um, I do know about these. These are Charlton books. The reason I am aware of these is that I do like war books when they have planes on the cover, especially like World War One or World War II. And I do have some fighting army ones with the planes on it. So these are pretty cool. I like these. Um, then we have some GI combat books. Um, again, DC printed them. Don't know much about them. Also early seventies. I think this one's funny featuring the haunted tank. Neat. Might even read that one. Got to see what it's about. Then we have a whole bunch of these, uh, DC Sergeant rock books. And I don't know, there's probably a dozen of them. I'm not going to go through all of them, but clearly this person liked this book, uh, the, the series. So these are really cool. The art on them is fantastic. This one's a 15 center. I know nothing about Sergeant Rock, so let me know down in the comments uh, if it's a cool character, if these are worth anything. Again, I haven't looked any of these up. I don't know if there's any key distinctions or whatever, but uh, they're pretty neat. Then we have a whole bunch of Sergeant Fury and his Howling Commandos. I'm pretty sure none of these are key books, but obviously Sergeant Fury um, is Nick Fury. The Howling Commandos are the guys who fought in World War II with Captain America. So um, this is the series that sort of introduced uh, Nick Fury. And uh, there's some pretty cool crossovers in these books, you know, with Captain America and stuff. Uh, again, I don't know much about these, but they're in there. This one, I have a bit more information on it. So this is DC Men of War. It's number one. It's a 35 cent comic book. And the reason why this one jumped out to me is that I mentioned I like war books if there are like airplanes on the cover. So one of the series I really like is Enemy Ace. Enemy Ace is a really cool character, uh, I think from World War One. So you get these cool like, you know, biplanes and stuff. I like those comic books. So I was looking at that and I saw this name right next to it, Grave Digger. And it rang a bell. I'm like, I've heard of Grave Digger before. So I looked it up and of course I know what it is. Uh, Grave Digger is sort of a super soldier type bad guy that was recently in the Black Lightning CW series played by Wayne Brady. Wayne Brady is usually a comedian and a singer, uh, you know, an actor, and I've never seen him in like in a serious role. But I watched some clips of him and he is kicking butt in this series. I mean, he definitely did some fight training. He did a great job or a stuntman was just really, really good. So I thought that was pretty cool. And this book actually is the first appearance of that character, Gravedigger. So little minor key there. Pretty cool comic book. Happy to have this one. Then we have three issues of The Nam. So obviously this is a comic series based on Vietnam. Um, and I actually have the number one issue. Um, I've never read the series. I don't know much about it. But again, I have three of them, including number one. Not bad. So that's it for all of the Western and war theme comic books. Now let's go to Marvel. So there's not a ton of Marvel comic books in here, but they're my favorite publisher. I'm happy to have all of these. And there's quite a few really cool ones. Let's start off with a bang with this. This is Adventure Into Fear number 23 featuring Morbius the Living Vampire. I'm not sure in the year of this, but obviously this must be a pretty early appearance by Morbius. Very cool looking book. Then we have Supervillain Team Up number two uh, featuring Namor and Doctor Doom. Uh, I am very aware of these books. I do collect these books because I like both of these villains. Uh, pretty cool. Then I have this random X Factor, X Factor number 21. Pretty sure I have this book already in my X-Men box. Then we have Man from Atlantis number three. No idea. Team America number two. Uh, then we have, we have a couple of these. Yep, we have three. The Hands of Shang-Chi, Master of Kung Fu. So we have issues number 22, 30, and 32. Uh, I don't know if there's any key significance here, but Shang-Chi's a pretty cool character, uh, and these are fun to have. I'll have to look them up later. We have Power Pack number 10. 
Then we have a Tarzan book. This is a Marvel Tarzan, number 18. And then we have another Tarzan, um, but this one is DC. So this is a second DC issue. So that's kind of cool. We have a, a Marvel, whoop, we have a Marvel and a DC Tarzan. That's kind of neat. And then we have a uh, Tarzan inspired character here. We have uh, Kazar, uh, Lord of the Hidden Jungle. He is from the Savage Land. Um, obviously, he's an older character. I believe he's from, you know, the Silver Age of Comics. He's basically Tarzan uh, and also crossed over with a lot of Marvel characters. I'm guessing this is his first solo issue. I'm guessing. And then uh, most of the books I've shown you are from the 80s or 70s. Uh, these next ones here are from the 90s. And I know that because I bought these books in the 90s. Um, so here we have the Warlock Chronicles number one with this crazy, shiny, foily cover. We have the Infinity Crusade number one. We have Goddess there, Aisha, on the cover. Again, I bought both those books off the, the newsstand, as well as this one. This is 2099 Unlimited number one. And um, I recently talked on my channel about how much I love the 2099 imprint. And uh, this one actually has some key significance. It's the first appearance of Hulk 2099 right there before he starred in his own series. So there you go, first appearance of Hulk 2099. And then we have the Incredible Hulk versus Quasimodo one-shot collector's item. Neat. So this book's awesome. I talked about this book recently on my channel. I'll put a link to that video right up here. But this is uh, Heroes for Hope starring the X-Men number one. So as I discussed in that video, what happens here is that, you know, Marvel basically uh, printed this book to raise money for the famine in East Africa, especially Ethiopia. And what's so cool about this book is that every couple pages in this book, the artist changes, the inker, the penciler, and the writer changes. And they got like basically a who's who of everyone in the comic industry to work on this book. Um, and there's even a couple of writers in this that aren't normally comic book writers, including George R. R. Martin and Stephen King. So very cool. I talked about this book in the past. I think it's an awesome book. It's especially one to collect, like if you want to see the different art styles. Really cool. Happy to pick up another copy of this. And then we have a couple of new universe comics. We have uh, DP7 number 12. And we have Mark Hazard, Merc. Never heard of either of these titles. So uh, that's it for the Marvel books. Let's go over to the DC books. Okay, let's start off with a character I've definitely heard of because I see his comic books absolutely everywhere. This is Arian, Lord of Atlantis, number one. I'm not sure if this is his first appearance or not. I know nothing about Arian, again, other than I see his comic books everywhere. I also have uh, another Arian special. It's almost like an annual uh, double size number one as well. Let me know down in the comments if you are an Arian fan. I find his comics all the time. This one cracks me up. This is Prez, number one, the first teen president of the United States. Have no idea how far this series went on or if this was a thing or a one-time issue, whatever. I just thought it was really interesting. This one's... Very interesting. So this is uh, called Gamma Rotters. I've heard this before, uh, that name, but I can't place it. The one thing I will say about it is that it is uh, also printed by TSR, who I know from doing Dungeons and Dragons way back in the day. This is the first issue. It says new format. I don't know anything about this. Rings a bell. Can't wait to look this one up. We have a whole bunch of first issues coming, guys, and uh, some, some of these are obscure. Here's the first one. Night Force, number one. Don't know anything about it. Hey, I've heard of this. This is Doom Patrol number one. We also have Doom Patrol number two. We have Robotech Defenders number one. Very cool, even on the back cover. All right, here's some more well-known DC stuff. We have All-Star Squadron number one. Very cool, we see uh, Hawkman, you know, looking for new members of this team. It's pretty cool. We also have another All-Star Squadron. This one's later. 19, uh, sorry, it's from 1986. It's number 53. And this looks like a Crisis on Infinite Earths crossover book. That's pretty cool. Then we have the Legion of Superheroes, number 313. Really cool cover there. Then we have Karate Kid, number five, Master of Martial Arts. Uh, not based on the movie, uh, based on the cool martial arts character in DC Comics. Then we have not one, but two, Shade the Changing Man, number one. Again, I don't know anything about this character. Let me know if you do. Then we have Supergirl, um, number two, The New Adventures of Supergirl. Now we're going old school, guys. I have a 12-cent Silver Age Superman right here. This is 
uh, number 164. Uh, not the most evocative cover, not the coolest cover, but hey, anytime you can find some Silver Age Superman, uh, very cool thing to pick up. All right, let's jump forward to the uh, 80s Superman, uh, later volume, number 408. Pretty cool. Then we have Superboy, number 16. Then we have Superman Presents the Phantom Zone, number one. Pretty cool looking comic book there. Oh, and also uh, the same series, number two. Ah, I know this one. This is Batman Legends of the Dark Knight. This is the blue cover. They had all sorts of different covers here. Um, that's pretty cool from November of 1989. Neat. I didn't have that book. So this one here, and I believe the next one, I think these are Jack Kirby creations. After he did New Gods, he had a whole bunch of kind of wacky characters he created. I think this is one of them. This is um, Atlas number one. Uh, again, I don't know anything about this character. I'm pretty sure it's Jack Kirby. And that's the case with the next one, too. This is OMAC, the One Man Army. I think OMAC stands for One Man Army Corps. I believe he's kind of like a cyborg, um, kind of like a Captain America if he was like from the future. And uh, yeah, not only do I have one, I have two. And, uh, you know, me and my sister were looking at this wondering, what the heck is going on with that woman in the box? We have no idea. I don't know. I'm afraid to look, but yeah, I got two OMAC number ones. I don't know if this is the character's first appearance, but again, I'm pretty sure it's a Jack Kirby creation. Let me know down in the comments if you are a OMAC fan. Then we have uh, the Warlord Annual, number one. We have a Firestorm Annual, number five. And maybe my favorite cover in here, Ambush Bug, number two. And this uh, koala you see is Qantas the Koala. Uh, he looks like a giant koala. I don't know what's going on, but I thought this cover uh, was a riot. So there you go. That concludes my DC comics, except for the really good ones I'm about to show you. So now we've come to the comic books that I think are the most notable in the collection. They're either, you know, certifiable keys or they're just really interesting and I want to talk about them right now. And first up is a great one. This is a comic book I've wanted for a real long time. I just never pulled the trigger on it. Here it is. This is Phoenix, the Untold Story. So I talk about it on the channel all the time. I'm a huge X-Men fan. I'm a huge Chris Claremont, John Byrne fan. I love all their collaboration that they did in the late 70s, early 80s on X-Men. And I really love the Dark Phoenix saga. You know, it's a storyline I strive very hard to get into my collection. And basically, you know, Jean Grey gets taken over by the Phoenix Force, becomes the Dark Phoenix, goes crazy, causes lots of death and destruction. And the storyline ends with Jean Grey very controversially taking her own life. The thing is, that wasn't the original ending intended by Chris Claremont. Um, what happened was the editor at the time, Jim Shooter, was reading the story and he saw all the horrible things that Jean Grey had done. Um, namely, she destroys a star system and kills like every being on this uh, inhabited planet. And he said, there's no way she should live at the end of this. I mean, too many horrible things have happened. So um, somewhat controversially, and I'm guessing uh, not without a lot of arguments, um, Chris Claremont and John Byrne changed the ending of number 137 and they changed it so that she died. But this book here, published years after the Dark Phoenix Saga, tells the untold story, the original story, the original panels that was intended. So half of this right here is actually a comic book telling that story. It's really cool. But then the second half of the book is actually an interview between all of the people that were involved, between Jim Shooter, Chris Claremont, John Byrne, and others about not just, you know, the editorial changes, but also the whole storyline. It's pretty much like a Netflix documentary on the Dark Phoenix Saga, just in a comic book. Very cool comic book to have, very happy to have it. I can't wait to read it. Um, again, I should have bought it a long time ago, but I'm happy to have it now. Awesome book. Oh, this next book is a near miss, guys. This is Marvel premiere featuring Iron Fist number 18. Number 15 is the first appearance of Iron Fist. Um, so they tell the story in Marvel premiere over four issues, starting with 15. So this is the fourth and final issue of the origin of Iron Fist. And this would be his fourth full appearance in comic books. So close. There weren't any other uh, comics uh, in this series in there. Um, still fantastic cover with Iron Fist right there. So close. You never know, guys. Next up, we have some 80s Superman goodness. We have Superman... Number four, it is from 1987, and of course, this is the first appearance of the character Bloodsport. Most people know Bloodsport these days because he was in the movie Suicide Squad, the good Suicide Squad, done by James Gunn, and Bloodsport was played by the awesome Idris Elba. Um, I like these early Superman issues of this volume because John Byrne did the first 
22 issues, both writing and doing the art. Um, this one's pretty beat up. It's a white cover. It's very stained, but still, hey, first appearance of Bloodsport, not a bad pickup at all. And next up, um, I don't think this is worth particularly much, but I love it. So this is Vault of Evil number one. Um, I love these early 70s horror comic books. Most of these, I believe, just reprint older horror stories. I think that's what's going on here. Still, fantastic cover, really good shape. And I also have issue number two. I just love these. Thought I'd talk about them at the end. Next up, we have some DC goodness. We have Saga of the Swamp Thing number one. Um, I believe this is the first issue of his new volume that came out. We also have the Swamp Thing annual based on the uh, Embassy Pictures film of the early 80s. Uh, so obviously the Swamp Thing, very cool swamp themed character um, that first appeared in the 70s. Uh, and this is a nice segue into my next comic book, which is another swamp monster. Man Thing. So this is the first issue of Man Thing's second volume. Uh, his first issue of his first volume you see right behind me. Um, this is a really cool book. Um, let's see, the cover's done by uh, Bob Wyacek. This is from 1979. And um, yeah, he came out, Man Thing, you know, the same summer, I think, as Swamp Thing. I think he beat Swamp Thing, you know, in comics by a couple of weeks. But neither of them can really lay claim that they're the first Swamp Monster because they're both ripoffs of many Swamp Monsters that were done in comics over the years, most notably The Heap who was a swamp theme character way back in the golden age. But still, Man Thing's awesome, very cool. And also, this is in fantastic shape, this book. Really high quality. Very happy to get this to add it to my other Man Thing comic. So now we're down to the last two comic books, and they're both pretty great. The first one is this, Ms. Marvel, number one. I believe it's from 1977, and this is the first appearance of Carol Danvers as Ms. Marvel. So she had showed up in comic books before this, mostly in the Captain Marvel storylines, but um, this is the first time she was in her own issue as a superhero, as a human Kree hybrid. Uh, and it's a pretty interesting uh, series. I mean, the idea at the time was to make a strong, independent woman. In fact, you know, the honorific Ms. was closely associated with the feminist movement of the late 70s. And, um, you know, they even have her in this book, like, fighting for equal pay, uh, you know, on her job, you know, w with men. However, in terms of it being like, uh, you know, associated with the feminist movement, I'm going to call it a near miss. Uh, as far as I know, no woman actually worked on this book. Uh, here she is in the skimpy outfit. In fact, Carol Danvers is known uh, for always having very skimpy outfits. I totally get why they put her in the flight suit eventually. But the one that kills me on this book, the worst part is this motto up here. This female fights back. Ouch. As if, <laughs> as if saying like, not all women fight back. I'm not exactly sure what they were supposed to do with that motto, but ugh. It's a little cringeworthy. Still, Carol Danvers is a very strong superhero associated with the Avengers. She's very popular, and I'm very happy to have the first issue. I will say this, too. Uh, this series only lasted, like, 23 issues, but there are a couple of keys in there that are doozies, uh, most notably number 18, which is the first full appearance of Mystique. So keep your eyes open for that one. So we finally come to the last book. Anyone who keeps their fingers on the pulse of comic books these days knows this book is on fire right now. Um, yeah, I'm just gonna show it to you. This is Booster Gold number one from 1986, and this is the first appearance of Booster Gold. Uh, his real name uh, is Michael John Carter. Uh, he was created by Dan Jurgens, and uh, yeah, basically the storyline behind him is that he is a character from the future who steals some, you know, superhero tech from his local museum and goes back in time to basically uh, make it big. And uh, yeah, he's kind of a not a great character, not a great person, but over time actually becomes a real superhero. And the reason why this comic book is so hot right now is everyone knows um, in the new DC universe being built by James Gunn, there's going to be a Booster Gold show. Um, so when my sister got these comic books, it was actually right before the, that DC announcement. You know, and a lot of people had been kind of specking on Booster Gold. I don't talk about speculation much, but... I'll talk about it right now. Um, a lot of people were saying Booster Gold would be a great character for James Gunn to adapt. So this comic book kind of started going up. So when my sister, you know, told me about all these comic books and sent me the pictures, I kind of joked with her. I said, that Booster Gold comic book isn't worth that much. But hey, you know, if they announce a new movie or series, uh, you know, it's going to go up in value. Two days later, after I told her that, um, they announced the show in this book like doubled in value overnight. So uh, here we go. We have Booster Gold number one. Not a book I necessarily would have bought, especially with how hot it is these days, but I'm pretty happy to have it right now nonetheless. It's in really good shape, pretty high grade, uh, and I think it's a pretty good capstone for the entire collection that I got. So there you go, guys. That was the entire collection of comic books my sister brought me all the way from Oregon. Here's the thing. She intended for this to be a birthday present, but once she was here, I reminded her she already got me a present this year. She actually sent me a couple of t-shirts, you know, comic book t-shirts that I've worn 
in my videos on this channel. And when I told her that, she's like, oh yeah, I completely forgot. And I felt really bad. She put so much work into this gift, you know, and flying it across the country and put a little bit of money into it. Still, 80 bucks, guys. I think she did fantastic. This is a great collection for $80. I think we can all agree. But so what I did was this. I said, I'll tell you what, for all your trouble, not only the amount of money she put into it, but, you know, packaging it up and flying across the country, all the research, I gave her $100 for these three comics and I let her give me the rest as part of my birthday present. So it was the least I could do. Um, but either way, guys, go down to those comments and let me know which of these comic books you like the best. Is it one of these sort of uh, bigger comic books here? Do you like these sort of uh, 80s cartoon uh, comic books? I know there's definitely a market for this. Uh, me personally, uh, my favorite is The Dark Crystal. Uh, it not only reminds me of being a kid, but specifically reminds me of watching this with my sister. Um, so whenever I look at this book, I will think about my childhood with her and also the fact she found these comic books for me. And let me know down in the comments if there's a comic book I missed. You know, if there's anything here of value or that's really interesting, I'd love to know about it. So that's it, guys. I hope you keep hunting for comic books in strange and unusual places and on Facebook Marketplace. You never know. Uh, thank you guys so much for watching, and I will see you all next time.